Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately, but we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day -day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. We're teaching through the Lord's Prayer. They're not just teaching through it, but really immersing ourselves in it. Uh, Jesus gave his disciples a prayer that, um, you know, they recognize. We've said this multiple times, but Jesus' disciples, they recognized something in him that made them want to learn to pray the way he prayed. They saw something about his prayer life that was more effective, more intimate, more rich, more powerful, something that was more life-giving. And so they said, would you teach us to pray like that? And so he gave them a prayer. This prayer we know is the Lord's Prayer. It starts with an introduction, kind of a, uh, an address, and then it's followed by seven petitions, seven asks. And we've been going through those line by line because they're not designed to be like a, a, a script, a limiting script that we just simply pray the script and then we're done. They're actually designed to be an outline that encompasses all of our lives. And, and the, the more that I'm in this prayer, as, as, as I just personally get to immerse myself in each line of this prayer each week and, and, and submit myself to this new request that we're in, the new petition for the week, I'm just struck by the, the, honest, the brilliance of Jesus' prayer. Like there's not a part of our life, there's not a part of our experience, whether, whether as, as brand new believers who've just, just entered into the faith, who've just begun to put our confidence in him, whether somebody who's brand new or somebody who's walked with Jesus for 50 years, like, it is, it is a perfect prayer that is relevant at every single stage of our lives, and it encompasses everything we might need, and it's, and it's brilliant in its progression. So, today as we get into it, we're, we're going to be in the sixth petition. If you put up this, here's our, here's our seven petitions. That they, there's, the first three are very centered on the Father. The first three have to do with your name, your kingdom, your will. And then the next four are very centered on the child. This is, so this whole thing is rooted in the father-child relationship. In fact, it begins with, with praying to a father, not to a distant God who, who might be unknown, unpredictable, capricious, but actually to a loving father who has shown himself to be faithful, powerful, good, kind, generous. And so with that in mind, with knowing who we're praying to, just begin with your kingdom, your, your name, your kingdom, your will, and then it shifts to the child. And it's give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. Today we're in that sixth one, lead us not into temptation. And so in the spirit of temptation, there's a, there's a plate on your table. Do you notice it? It's filled with candy corn. And it says, do not, what does it say, do not touch? <laughs> That's like a little, you know, in the garden, God told them not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of it. And when the serpent came, he said, did God really say you shall not even touch it? It's interesting. Do not touch. How many of you were tempted to sneak just one candy corn? If you're honest. How many actually did sneak a candy corn? <laughs> you're not going to die. They're not made of x lax or anything. We did... We did we did think about chocolates with some x lax but no. Some of, you may have, some of you may have been tempted by this, but you restrained yourself because you thought, no, it's going to be an object lesson, and I'm not going to let him humiliate me. But I suspect that a lot of you came in here not even thinking of candy corn, but as soon as you saw one, you wanted it, because that's the nature of temptation. It's what we're dealing with today. And so today, this, this petition, lead us not into temptation, it, de it deals with something, it, 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 it is on a topic that's very relevant to our daily life. And remember, this is a prayer that Jesus gave disciples, followers. This isn't, this isn't a prayer he gave to just anyone. He gave it to people who were actually desirous of following him, of learning how to do life from him. Disciples, followers, apprentices. And he said, well, every day, pray, lead us not into temptation, because temptation is a part of the daily life where we live, because we live in between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. 
on the other side of the second coming, on the other side of eternity, I don't know exactly what eternity is going to be like, but there won't be this, this drive to sin, this temptation, where, where when we see a sign that says don't touch, we automatically want to touch it. We won't experience that on the other side of eternity, but, but this side, in between Jesus' first and second coming, we do. And so Jesus said, I want you to daily ask for help with that. Daily ask, lead us not into temptation. Today we're going to talk about the origins of temptation, the seriousness of temptation, and the solution of temptation. So we start with this, this final request, Matthew 6, 13. The, the last two requests, number six and seven, they go together. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's a negative there and a positive. Lead us not to temptation, that's the negative. Instead, deliver us from evil, that's the positive. One's focused on our internal capacity for evil. One's ex- focused on the external capacity, the external pressure to do evil, the temptation. So Eugene Peterson, in, in the, the message, he translates it like this. He says, keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You like that? It's simple. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. They do go side by side, but we're going to look at them one at a time. Um, I want you to notice that when Jesus talks about temptation, he says, lead us not to temptation. He's actually encouraging us to pray daily something that is very countercultural to 21st century American culture. Okay, regardless of what it's meant for other cultures and other times and spaces, I would just suggest that for us thinking about our culture, we're actually encouraged by our culture to yield to every temptation. That, that, w- that whatever we desire, we should reach out and take that thing. That it's actually, our, our culture actually teaches us that, there, that, it's, that it's wrong to deny yourself the things that you want unless it's obviously going to harm someone else. But even that caveat's very rarely followed. Our, te- our culture teaches us to, to welcome, to embrace temptation, to actually normalize it. Jesus teaches us to resist it. So the origin, well, briefly, I'd say the origin actually goes back all the way back to the garden. You go back to the Garden of Eden, a time when... when uh, Mankind functioned as God's representatives within creation. We were, we were appointed to be God's vice regents, living under his authority, stewarding his authority that had been entrusted to mankind. Something shifted when our first parents were, what? They were tempted by the enemy. They were tempted to cross God's boundary, believing that it wasn't in their best interest. And this boundary that do not eat was him withholding something good from them. In that moment, in the moment where they reached out and they took the thing that God had said, don't, don't touch this. If you touch this, you will surely die. If you eat of this, is what he said, actually, you will surely die. In the moment they reached out and touched it and they partook, something in them shifted. And something about mankind's very nature shifted. Something was passed along subsequently to every person ever born after our first parents, an innate drive and innate desire to live independent of God's good governance, to instead choose self-governance, determining for ourselves the rules that we will live by. And that nature, that desire to self-govern, it manifests itself every time we encounter some sort of boundary. So the reason we put these plates on the table is just to awaken us in a very subtle way to that, that thing that happens inside of us when we're told, don't. Do not touch, do not eat, do not cross Something inside of us just because, and that's our, that's our fallen human nature. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8 or chapter 7 when he, he talks about the unredeemed human heart. And he says that, that the nature of a boundary is not the, like God's law. When God gives us a law or a boundary and says, don't cross this, that's, the problem isn't the boundary. The problem is that it exposes what's inside of us. It doesn't, it doesn't create sin. It exposes the sinful nature. And so when we come across the boundary and it says, don't touch, don't eat, don't cross. Something in us raises up. So the origin of temptation is that it traces back to our first parents in the garden. And so now it not only comes from without, from an enemy of God who very does, much does want to steal, kill, and destroy, it also comes from within. Okay, this is the nature of, of temptation. James tells us, though, that that temptation does not come from God. Listen to, to James talking about the origins of temptation. He says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, 
If only has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. James is there talking about that fallen human nature that's passed along from our first parents, this desire to decide for ourselves how we will live and which boundaries we will and won't cross. And James goes on to say, that desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully bir- grown, gives birth to death. It brings forth death. Let me read that one more time. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. There's a, there's a powerful visual metaphor here. Sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. James here doesn't speak just to the origins of temptation. He also speaks to the seriousness of it. Temptation is something we can make light of. There's cartoons of, you know, little devils tempting people with, to do the wrong thing. We sort of make light of it. And even the candy corn is a little bit misleading because it makes it sort of like, well, it's just, yeah, it's just a piece of candy corn. What's it going to hurt? Hurt. But James talks about the, the seriousness of temptation, and it begins with a desire so small that it appears to be innocent or benign or harmless. Here's, here's the way temptation begins. We never start in temptation. We never start with it thinking, oh, I want to I go down this road because it's going to lead to destruction. It starts with something just innocent, simple. This is, this is why it's temptation. It's just one piece of candy corn. But when that temptation is acted upon, it's like a seed planted in fertile soil. Or like an egg fertilized at precisely the right moment. And that embryo of sin gestates, often hidden in the darkness, but nevertheless growing. And when that gestation is complete, it births sin, which if allowed to mature, leads to death. So what's the seriousness of temptation? Is that temptation appears deceptively harmless, but when acted upon, matures into destruction and eventually death. Jesus, he builds this into a daily prayer because what's writing on this is so important. It's important for, for the way that we represent him in the world. It's, a, it's important for the, the joy of our own lives. You know, those two things are not divorced. We, this morning when I prayed, I prayed that we would live for God's glory and that in this we would find our greatest joy. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. They go together. And so when, when God gives us a boundary for his glory, it's also for our greatest joy. Let me give you an example of how temptation works, just to put this into practical terms. Consider, consider a spouse who's feeling unsatisfied in their marriage. Maybe their relationship is not as exciting as it once was. Intimacy is, intimacy is not as frequent as it once was. Maybe the mutual admiration of the early days seems to have been replaced with conflict and with criticism. Perhaps... The spouse feels unappreciated or unacknowledged by their own spouse. Maybe he or she feels like the kids now get all of their spouse's attention. But there's that co-worker who seems to notice. The co-worker who seems to appreciate, seems exciting. And there's that little spark of something whenever they cross paths throughout the day. And so this discontented spouse begins to imagine what life might be like with the coworker. And what begins as just a passing thought begins to occupy a growing space in their mind and heart, especially whenever there's conflict or frustration at home. And then one day there's an opportunity to move the daydream forward just a little bit, just with a little compliment, a conversation, maybe a hidden text thread, a gift, a lunch, a ride, a dinner. And six months later, he or she is filing for divorce, breaking up the marriage, devastating the family, depriving kids of a a two-parent family. Death. Temptation obeyed begins what Casting Crowns called a slow fade. Casting Crowns has a song called Slow Fade. I I copied some of the lyrics in here. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance that ties your hands. 
as darkness pulls the strings. Be careful, little feet, where you go, for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices made. A price will be paid. When you give yourself away, people never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. When flattery leads to compromise, the end is always near. Be careful, little lips, what you say. For empty words and promises lead broken hearts astray. The journey from your mind to your hands is shorter than your thinking. Be careful if you think you stand. You just might be sinking. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade. Choice is made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. Daddies never crumble in a day. Families never crumble in a day. The example I gave and the, and the, the, the lyrics of the song, they, they touch on this idea of, of a marriage that's breaking up over unfaithfulness, over this slow fade that begins with a temptation that's acted upon. But death starts with temptation, takes all kinds of forms. It, the person who got fired for embezzling from the company started with something small that seemed like no big deal, that was just fudging on their time card a little. The person who blows up their life with addiction started with just one more drink, just one more pill. The person who destroys their relationships through violence, through coerciveness and manipulation, they never started with violence in their heart, with murder in their heart. They just wanted to get their own way. So, is this depressing? <laughs> Talked about the origins temptation. We talked about the seriousness of temptation. What's the solution? What's the solution for navigating this minefield without destroying our lives and those around us? For Jesus' disciples and followers, this petition to be led away from temptation is actually the natural progression following the petition for forgiveness. Again, this prayer, there's a sequence to it that is absolutely brilliant because before asking for help with temptation, lead us not into temptation, the first request is Forgive us. Forgive us for our own trespasses. Forgive us our debts. We're asking God to extend mercy to us for the ways that we've wronged him and others. It's not something we have earned. The forgiveness that Janet took us through last week, we did, it doesn't say, God, would you um, show us how we can pay you back so that we can get back into good graces with you. Show us how to pay the debt that we owe. It's simply an ask. <laughs> would you forgive us? Would you forgive us our trespasses, forgive our debts? Forgive the boundaries that we've crossed, the trespasses. Forgive the price that is due to make things right for where we've done wrong. In theological terms, when we, when we ask for forgiveness, we're asking to be justified. We're asking to be acquitted and declared righteous. We're asking that our record would be cleared, our record expunged. We're asking that our guilt would be exchanged for Jesus' innocence. That's what we've just asked for when we, when we ask in, in, the, in that fourth petition, or fifth petition, forgive our debts. So we get to this next petition, and believing that we have received forgiveness, that we have freedom from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin, the loving child now asks to maintain that status of freedom forgiven. Here's what happens when a person first surrenders their life to, to God, and, and, and we're, we're, we're called born again, where Jesus says to, in John, the book of John, he says, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again, you must be born of the Spirit. When we surrender our lives to God, there's, there's a transformation that happens. It's, it's not always visible on the outside, though sometimes it is, but fundamentally our nature's changed, and that, and that nature that, that, that made us long for disobedience that made us reach out and, and always want the, to cross the boundary, something in us has changed where, where now our natural inclination is for righteousness. The problem is, is we've got old habits. Our nature's changed, but our habits aren't changed. This petition speaks to the reality of every disciple or follower of Jesus who lives in between his two appearances. 
We're already forgiven, we're already justified, but we're being transformed, we're being sanctified. And so the prayer for forgiveness is, please, please make me clean. The prayer regarding temptation is, please keep me clean. In other words, we will be tempted, let us not sin. And Jesus, by putting this into a daily prayer, takes away the shame of thinking that we're the only one and that no one else deals with the same temptations I do. This prayer to resist temptation, to be led on new paths rather than the well-worn ruts of our old life is, a, is to be led on new paths rather than the well-worn ruts of our own life apart from Christ. i got a picture for you here. You notice in the picture, there's a well-worn path through this wilderness. But this person journeying is not actually walking on the path. They're actually walking off to the side, creating a new path. The, the reality of our life, this is, the, this is the Christian experience, that when we surrender our lives to God, there's, there's deep grooves, there's these deep paths in our life that we're used to habitually walking. And those include behaviors, those include mindsets, heart sets. The idea that we'll choose for ourselves, those are, those are the patterns that are deeply ingrained in our life. But when a person is born again, God puts a spirit inside of them, something fundamentally changed. We're told in Ezekiel 36 that hearts of stone become hearts of flesh. Something is, our, our very DNA has changed. So that, so that if that's allowed to mature, if that, if that seed is allowed to grow and mature, to be birthed, and to come to full maturity, we'll become righteous, like, like Jesus. But that's, that's on the other side of eternity, but that's what we're moving towards. But meanwhile, we, we live in between these two appearances of Jesus, and we've got these old habits. So how do we get free from those habits? It's a daily acknowledgement that we still have them. Dallas Willard des describes this prayer as a vote of no confidence. It's a vote of no confidence in our own ability to choose right apart from God's empowerment, apart from leaning into the power of his indwelling spirit in order to choose life instead of death. As those born anew, as those born again, we, we now have a new heart, but we still have the old habits. We still have the capacity when tempted to choose self-rule, to choose independence, to choose rebellion. And so this petition is a daily posture of humility in which we acknowledge our capacity for sin and our need for empowering grace because the way in is the way on. We acknowledge our desire to mature in our new nature. James, in that same verse that I just read about the, the destructiveness, what's the origin of sin where, or temptation? Where does it come from? If we keep reading that paragraph, he goes on to say this. He says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might become a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Instead of yielding to temptation, we're called to yield to our new nature. And this daily petition, lead us not to temptation, is a way to cooperate with our heavenly Father's intention to not only free us from sin, but to transform us to be like him. So church, I'm done. Lead us not into temptation. Jesus includes this in a, a prayer that's designed for us to pray daily because it cultivates in us a, a humility. A humility that acknowledges, I, I can't do the life that I'm called to do apart from you, but I want to do it. I want to grow in, in, in living life that reflects you as you are, that doesn't distort you through disobedience, through rebellion, through, through destroying my life and the lives of those around me. And so you know the things that tempt me would you give me the grace today to recognize them for what they are, to not be fooled by thinking, oh, it's just a little thing, but to recognize it for what it is and to choose to walk away from that and towards godliness. In Titus, Paul, Paul says to, the, to the, the Cretan church, he says, the grace of God has now appeared. This is an empowering grace. The grace of God has now appeared, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to instead live lives that are upright, godly, 
We daily ask this prayer. We're saying, God, would you help me to see it today? Don't, don't let the wool be pulled over my eyes. Don't let me fool myself. Don't let me be fooled by the enemy. Would you give me the grace to resist temptation today? Let me not fall. And, and, and so having prayed this, here's what we know. Whatever we encounter in the day, any kind of hardship, anything that would tempt us to, to turn our back on God, to renounce his call on our life, anything that would tempt us to, to behave in ways that we know to be sinful or destructive, anything that comes toward us, God has allowed to come through his fingers. And that means he'll give us the grace to then walk in it. Anything that God allows through his fingers also comes with the, with the grace, the empowering grace to resist and to walk in purity. This is a work of the Spirit of God, Spirit of the living God. So I'm going to ask you to, to just um, to close your eyes. And I just want to say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, would you remove the the scales from our eyes that we might see our own lives as you see us? That we might see the capacity that you've placed within us, that you've birthed within us, to grow in, in righteousness, to grow in, in Christ-likeness. Would you also give us eyes to see the temptation, the, the path that is before us in this moment? And Heavenly Father, rather than choosing paths of least resistance, of choosing paths of, uh, of normalizing temptation and, and, and giving ourselves over to, to what the world says is good, Would you give us the grace to entrust ourselves to you and to want, to desire, to long for righteousness, to be grieved by our own sin, to be grieved by the damage that we do to one another, to be grieved by by how we misrepresent and distort and grieve you. And as we daily pray this prayer, would you awaken in us a longing for righteousness? Would you awaken in us a dependency on you that in humility we would acknowledge we can't choose right on our own strength, but that we can look to you for the strength to resist temptation. We can look to you for the empowering grace to renounce ungodliness and to choose godliness. God, we ask this, that you would be glorified in this corner of your pasture, that as we move out from here into the world, that what we carry into the world would be the best representation of you we can, we can carry. A reflection with fewer and fewer distortions. So when people look at us, they would, they would long for you. Would you bring the breaking in us where we've hardened ourselves through, through repeated giving ourselves over to temptation? Would you bring the breaking And would you reduce us to love and to obedience? I'm just going to invite you to do business with God this morning. Business is maybe the wrong language. Talk to your Heavenly Father. There's nothing in you he doesn't already see, nothing in you he doesn't know better than you know yourself. He doesn't look to criticize. He looks to heal.
I believe this morning that the Holy Spirit is in work in many of us. I believe there's some who've been bumping up against a, a guardrail. On the other side of that guardrail is destruction. And you know that, that this is part of the, the process of temptation. You're, you've been, there's been a disquiet in you that you know you're getting too close to something and you've told yourself, it's okay, I'm not, I'm not clear over on the other side of it yet. And God's inviting you to come back. He's inviting you to, to receive forgiveness, to receive grace, to receive an empowering grace, to live a life that is pleasing to him, that is for the sake of the people around you, that is for your joy. So I'm going to say a closing prayer over us. And um, our prayer team's here this morning. Um, if you'd like prayer, if there's somebody at your table who can pray with you, that's fantastic. That's what we believe. Um, we believe that the body of Christ, we're, we can pray for one another. We've got some words for prayer we're going to put on the screen. And um, I just encourage you, whether you pray with somebody else or not, the most important thing is that you talk to your Heavenly Father today. I want to keep inviting you to, to make this prayer that Jesus gave us uh, a basic part of your daily life. This is discipleship. This prayer, we, we could be discipled by this prayer alone because it's brilliant. It's all-encompassing. It touches on every aspect of our discipleship. So just stand with me. I'll close in prayer. We've got some words for prayer. We'll put them on, on the screen. If you need prayer this morning and there's nobody at your table, you're welcome to come up front. Our prayer team can meet you up here. But if you're on the prayer team and you're at a table, maybe you can just let yourself be known. Heavenly Father, as we entrust ourselves to you today, you've shown yourself to be altogether good, altogether kind, altogether merciful, and altogether holy. May we not make light of your holiness. May we not buy into the cultural narrative that, that we should surrender to every temptation, every desire. May we see those desires that are destructive for what they are. Would you take the blinders off of our minds and hearts and spirit? Or would you give us the grace to turn today? The grace to turn away from ungodliness and to choose instead new paths of righteousness. Lord, as we make this prayer a part of our, our discipleship with you, as we, as we recite it and, and, and flesh it out in our mornings and while we're driving and in our quiet time, would you use it to shape us that our life might truly be a testimony to your goodness and your holiness, to your power to change and transform, your power to set free, May our lives then be for the sake of others, neighbors, coworkers, family. And in all of this, may we find our deepest joy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go make the invisible God visible. <laughs>